SpaceX's solution to combat the roar of 33 Raptors has received more work, with the steel plate and its manifolds being installed at the launch site. With some modifications to Starship's hot staging, and we have booster testing coming soon. My name's Ryan Kazen, and this is your Starbase Update. The ship quick disconnect plumbing's back. It has been lifted on top of the QD arm once again. Of course, this now includes the modification of it being in a higher position, as with the recently announced hot staging, including new rings on top of the booster, the point of connection to the ship has raised up about two meters. If you compare this QD to the previous position, you can see where it gained two meters of height to connect to the future ships. We also saw the movement of what is suspected to be one of the stabilizer pins being moved to the OLM. These pins are there to guide the booster on its way down during lift operations. You don't want to dent your Raptors because you hit them on the OLM. This week also saw more concrete pouring at the orbital launch site. Over 200 concrete trucks have been used up to this point in the repairs to the orbital launch pad so far after the inaugural integrated flight. It really puts it into perspective just how big this infrastructure really is. And you can really see how much concrete they are pouring into this pad here. All day and night, concrete trucks are moving in and out of the launch site to support the 24-7 operation. Of course, this is all in preparation for the new deluge system as well, which is one of the biggest modifications for the second flight. Here you can see one of the massive deluge pipes being lifted and placed in the previously dug out trenches as SpaceX starts to install the water line from the new water tanks. Earlier in the week, SpaceX placed the steel plate on the installation stand and moved it between the legs of the mount. Here it was then supported by crane reaching through the hole for the engines which would then carefully place it on the ground in the designated spot. After installation the steel plate was lifted up and placed back down several times probably to ensure that it fit properly nice and snug in the area beneath the launch mount. Once the plate finally reached its proper position and rested below the mount the installation of the manifolds could begin. Here you can see one of the manifolds next to the OLM being removed from its transporter. Late at night, more parts of the deluge system moved down the highway to the launch site on board an SPMT, this time sadly without any people on it. We also saw the return of the dance floor which is used to work below the booster once it is on the OLM. Since there is no booster there right now, it might be related to fit checks with the new floor and steel plate to see if access to the plate is still available. The deluge manifolds which will move the water into the steel plate were also rolled out to the launch site. You can see the massive pipe connection demonstrating just how much water is expected to be flowing through here. Late at night, SpaceX started to install these manifolds. With the current pace SpaceX is showing, it doesn't sound ridiculous anymore to expect the return of booster testing in just a couple of weeks. Of course, before that, we hope to see some pad and deluge testing. Over at the suborbital launch site, we can see Ship 25 and some work going on below it, which is most likely some inspections after its recent static fire campaign. While it lost some thermal protection tiles, besides that, it seems to be in great shape, at least from what we can tell from the outside. For many weeks, the chopsticks have been chilling out near the top of the tower at the orbital launch pad. This is probably related to all of the ongoing work at the bottom of the tower, so the easiest way to not have the chopsticks get in your way is to raise them up. It's still interesting to see how long these sticks can remain in this raised position. It seems as if there are no issues for the cables and structure at all. Of course, we need to point out the giant elephant in the room, which was this huge American flag flying over the launch site in celebration of the nation's Independence Day. Taking a look at the production site, the next level of the new mega bay is making progress. With this installation, all four corners of the third level are now installed. A quick note, while we might refer to it as Mega Bay 2, as that's the agreed upon nickname in the community, it's probably not the official name. For example, the first mega bay is officially known as High Bay 2. But wait, there's more. Another segment of the mega bay was moved from the pre-production area to the construction site. SpaceX really is assembling this new building at a mind-boggling pace. In case you didn't know, the preparation area for the mega bay is behind the Starbase sign. Here we can see multiple segments of the new building being prepared and assembled. Over at the old mega bay, also known as High Bay 2, Booster 9 is still waiting to begin its static fire campaign. It is joined by Booster 10, which is on the other side of the bay. 
More on that booster in a minute. Both Ship 28 and Ship 29 are also awaiting their test campaigns. There's a chance that SpaceX will begin testing with them once the orbital launch site is occupied with B9 testing, as it seems that Ship 25 testing is mostly complete at this point. What we could see is a rollback of Ship 25 to make space at the launch site a final inspection at the Rocket Garden before rolling it out again for stacking on top of Booster 9. Over at the tent yard we can see the new production building expansion being built. For now it is just the initial frame but with the current pace it's just a matter of time before it'll get its cladding. Do not mistake this building to be small. It doesn't help when you have the high base for scale but as you can see here with the cranes below it, it is massive. It's also slowly getting its roof. Later in the week, a fourth level of the Mega Bay was started, with one of the first corners going up. And to close off this week at the production site, we saw some work on the thermal protection system on upcoming ships. You can see the yellow markings on the TPS tiles and also some missing half tiles next to the weld lines of this ship. Even further down Highway 4, over at the Massey's test site, not much happened at the beginning of the week. We see the usual few test tanks and cranes, but beside that it seems to be quiet, which would change later in the week. It's always a good sign at Starbase to see traffic cones. These cones usually mark a no parking area in preparation for a vehicle rollout. However, What's special about these ones is that they lead to the former gun range. We also saw counterweights being placed on SPMTs on the day before the rollout, which indicates that a heavy payload will be loaded onto them. These counterweights make sure that the center of mass of the whole stack is stable. This reduces the risk of a precious ship or booster tipping over into the South Texan marshland. Late at night, Booster 10, probably the next super heavy booster to fly after B9, rolled out to the Massey's test site. Here it will undergo cryogenic proof and pressure testing before rolling back to the production site for engine installation. SpaceX built this Massey's test site to move these more tedious cryo tests away from the launch site to not get in the way of ongoing infrastructure work there right now and flight campaigns in the future. Another bonus, no big road closure is needed for the roll from the production site to Massey's and back. This image of the underside of a Starship was shared by Elon Musk on Sunday and even though it may seem a bit bland on the surface there's a lot we can uncover. First of all let's identify this ship. In the corners of the image we can see some sort of infrastructure resembling a test stand leading to Ship 25. This could be confirmed by this little box right here which is the hydraulic power unit. Ship 25 is the last ship with this on board and you may remember Booster 7's HPU failing spectacularly during the first integrated flight. If we take a closer look at the Raptor vacuums, the three larger engines around the outside of the engine section, you can see that they've actually been bolted to suborbital pad B which is used as a test stand. The engine nozzles need to be rigid during firing so that they don't break. The RVAC is optimised for a vacuum, it's in the name, and at sea level there can be flow separation of the exhaust, so whenever they're tested on the ground, be it at McGregor or on the stand at Starbase, they have this bracing to keep the nozzle from deforming. But don't worry, they have remove before flight tag, so the team down in South Texas knows to unbolt them before the ship flies. So what do you think? Will Booster 10 be the next one to fly, or will SpaceX skip a few steps after the next flight and move to a booster lower down the family tree? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.